Thank you very much for the kind words. And before I begin my talk, I must make a confession. I'm not a Thomist. Uh, you probably didn't expect that from a lecture sponsored by the Thomistic Institute, but um, I don't know enough about the angelic doctor to consider myself a Thomist. Uh, I'm all the more grateful that I've been invited here, surrounded by two scholars of Aquinas and two students of Aquinas. And I'm glad that you didn't ask me to speak on Aquinas. There is something else you should know. This is my first time in Texas. <laughs> I once met the late Tristram Engelhardt, who taught ethics at Rice. And after he found out I was from Bavaria, he came over to me and looked at me and said, you know, Bavarians and Texans have a lot in common. We both have our own language. We love leather clothes, and he was pointing to his boots and we were both occupied by a bigger country. Um, <laughs> I love our independence. I was tempted to wear my later hose in today to show you my, my Bavarian heritage, but I thought it would be a tad too much. God is not nice is the topic of the lecture tonight, and if I told you and if you told someone you were planning to attend such a lecture, you might have gotten a strong reaction when you mentioned the title of the lecture. It happens to me all the time, even in faculty meetings sometimes. People either giggle or groan when they hear it, even among theologians. And I think that's a good thing, because obviously the phrase, God is not nice, strikes a chord, but also because it causes associations with the hearer's own expectations and beliefs, whether they are Christian or not. It's even a great conversation starter. I sometimes just leave it on my coffee table when I uh, am in a hotel uh, lounge or something, um, including my own children. My seven-year-old recently frowned and asked me what I meant by God is not nice. She was very critical what God has written there and uh, what, what Dad has written there. It's good if your kids come to you and ask those kind of questions, instead of asking them and accepting teachings from elsewhere. So the idea for this book, which has meanwhile been translated into Spanish, German, and soon Portuguese and Polish, quite surprising, came from asking my students about their views about God. Who is God for you? What are the attributes that describe God the best? And the most frequent answer I got was, God is nice. Nice, however, was and is a word, if you consult a dictionary, that means everything and nothing. Originally, it also meant somewhat dim-witted. So I began to wonder why people describe God with such fuzzy, empty words. There must be a reason. And as a German, probably with a tendency to rationalism, you tend to inquire. Don't we have better words, better adjectives? And is it perhaps dangerous to blindly accept such descriptions of God? One day I decided to push my students a little bit more out of their comfort zone, as I usually do, and I began class by saying, God is not nice. He loves some more than others. I wanted to see their reactions. And indeed, I got them. Some frowned, and others looked visibly upset. But it started a conversation. It woke them up. And we need to wake up and continuously question our assumptions about God. Of course, an atheist like Christopher Hitchens can get away with saying God is not great. And the book title alludes a little bit to that. But a theologian going around saying God is not nice something totally different. I'm sure some probably wondered whether that meant I thought of God as primarily vengeful. I even got a letter, true story, from a retired religion professor before the book was even out, who was worried that I would confuse the faithful by bringing back the wrathful God of old times, fire and brimstone. I told him he should wait and read the book before judging it literally from its title and its cover. So why is nice an inadequate term for describing God? 
I think because we use it to describe our mostly, mostly our very superficial interactions. If we have a pleasant encounter with a salesperson on a phone, we say the person was nice or very nice. Or we meet an old school buddy for a brief moment of time, we can use this adjective adequately. Of course, we also use it with our own kids when we tell them to be nice. But we really mean behave well, be a good person. That's what we actually mean, although we don't say it. Sometimes we do, of course. The letter got me thinking, though. Is it not better to admonish our children to be good people and to behave, to consider good and evil, than simply remind them to be nice? After all, being nice can also mean putting up a facade or pretending when you don't actually mean anything. So let's sum up our findings. When we describe God as nice, we impose upon God himself a characteristic that is derived from superficial encounters with others. It turns God into someone who has a pleasing effect on me, something like soul wellness. God is seen ultimately then as someone who is responsible for making me feel well and feel comfortable. If God is nice, then he won't refuse me what I ask from him or require, just as any service provider we engage with. After all, we give him a prayer, and so he should be nice and give us something back. With such a God, we can make deals or bargains, as if he's a kind merchant at a farmer's market. But unlike the real world, this God, if he's so described, is really a pushover. C.S. Lewis saw this danger already in the 1940s and 1950s, when he remarked that most Christians don't want a father in heaven, but rather a divine grandpa. Such a divine grandpa does not admonish or punish, but ra rather buys the pr Christmas present that we want. Nice God theology tends to view God as a person responsible for our well-being. Now, there's obviously a truth in this. Christ called himself the physician of our soul. He healed the sick and so forth. And there's a great treasure in reflecting on God healing us. Nevertheless, healing is not what the nice God theology seeks. Because healing presupposes that there is something wrong with you that requires a physician or a surgeon to treat the sickness that bothers you. I strongly believe that the nice God theology only wants the effects of healing, the warm, fuzzy feelings, but not the extirpation of the disease or the radical change necessary to defeat it. It desires somewhat a colorful band-aid, although the doctor prescribed open-heart surgery. Nice God theology, as we often find it and encounter it, diminishes or eliminates the demands of God in our lives and makes faith an hour-long Sunday exercise only. He's not needed for the rest of the time because we are busy with our lives trying to achieve this or that. We downplay the biblical task about becoming holy or being transformed as too radical or medieval or no longer contemporary because we want a soft, easygoing, comfortable version of Christianity, preferably without a cross. By the way, these remarks you can also find, uh, perhaps not as pushy and provocative, in uh, Joseph Ratzinger's Introduction to Christianity, which I think is really one of the best books written uh, in the last 100 years. Such a person does not surrender his life into God's hands, but holds most of himself back. Perhaps he calls on God in a crisis, but when things are going great, he doesn't bother him. 
And ultimately, God doesn't play a role in this person's life. And consequently, grace has no chance to, no chance to transform that person. I strongly suspect that this is the view that many Catholics and many Christians have of God. And because they do not know the life-changing God, they get bored with their faith, which is another finding uh, among my students, but also among um, First Communion and Confirmation children I teach. They find very often church faith incredibly boring. And to be true, sometimes we make it that way. And the question is why? Mostly, they do not see that they have to change their life. But for what, after all? They only see a toothless God, something that's not really worth changing for. A God who is so boring that he does not seem to make any demands and rejoices over well, everything we do anyway. A God who forgives everything even if we don't feel any remorse. So why change? And this brings me to the second thing that shocked my students. I said, God loves some more than others. If you believe in a nice God, this statement goes against your dearest beliefs and also seems to run against our modern ideas about equality. Yet it only appears so on the surface. The fact is, Nobody has the right to be loved by God. If God exists, he created us, but that does not mean that he is obliged to love us. He does love us, don't get me wrong, but that love is a gift. I like to think about it this way. I've never doubted for one second that God loved our Blessed Mother more than me. It never created any intellectual or moral problem or hurdle for me since it seemed fairly obvious that somebody full of grace and without sin is more lovable in God's eyes than a wretch like me. I still sing a wretch like me. I don't know if you uh, know that in some songbooks, Amazing Grace was changed. I still sing the old version. Um, now we could also use the great masters of scholastic theology to explain this further. Some say that God loves us all with the same intensity, but with different degrees. That means the love that God has for St. Thomas Aquinas and for me is the same. It's not two different acts, but the degree is different because he calls some to greater intimacy with him than others, bestows on them the graces, but not on others. And a doctor of the church, St. Therese of Lisieux, and if you haven't read St. Therese of Lisieux, I strongly encourage that you do. Um, I'm trying to teach my undergrad students as much as possible about St. Therese of Avila and about St. Therese. She said, in heaven, I wonder, we'll be a little bit like cops, the size of which will be determined by the amount of love we gave God. And this is my own words, if Aquinas is the sign of a very large pint glass, I will probably be a thimble. De De uh, not Descartes, I'm sorry. This is, this is the 17th century scholar Dante. Dante describes a hierarchy in heaven. And when Beatrice is asked whether she would like to advance to the higher levels of heaven, she responds with what I think is one of the greatest lines in poetry ever produced. She says, his will is our peace. His will is our peace. There is no shuffling in heaven for a better spot because heaven is pro-existence, existent for the other, love of God. And in his will, we will find our peace. My statement that God loves some more than others is a sharp reminder that heaven is different from our lives and that Christianity is a radically different way of life on this side of eternity. Perhaps that's why it bothered my students so much. But let us also talk a little bit about the roots of such a view of God 
After all, I'm a historian. One reason people use the word nice to describe God is because they don't know any better. Sure, generations have been catechized, or better yet, uncatechized in such ways, and not just in the Catholic Church. Some may even have been properly taught by their parents at home, but didn't give a diamond about it once they grew up. One can love only what one knows. And if we do not dare to explore the faith, we should not be surprised if we don't fall in love with God. Now, this does not mean intellectual pursuit only, but encounter in prayer and silence of the heart. A little story about this. So we pray, obviously, at home with our children. And my fourth grade daughter, for ever since a year or two years ago, uh, says she wants to be a nun. And she always asked me, so, Dad, how do I know what God wants from me? And I said, well, you, you have to listen with the ears of your heart. You have to pray about it to find out what God calls you to. She said, okay, okay. Literally, the next morning, she comes down to breakfast and says, I'm going to be a Carmelite. Set in stone for her for now. So um, she reads, she read all the biographies of Teresa, um, of Avila, Teresa of Lisieux, Edith Stein. She is convinced she's going to be a Carmelite. Um, listening to the silence in your heart is a powerful thing. And the same I uh, recommend to everybody in, uh, in a crisis, but also before a great decision in your life. Um, before I seriously started dating my wife, I said, I have to make sure that this is the right way, that God does not want me to become a priest. And because I was thinking about that. And so I did a 30-day retreat, which I can only recommend. It's worth the money and the energy. Because after this 30-day pressure cooker with God, you actually know what God wants from you. And that's the beauty of the Ignatian exercises. So if God exists and is the Lord of all, then we should want to know him better. And I do not only do this through prayer, but also through the church, his mystical body. And I think here is another route. Many people have unrealistic expectations about the church. The church has lost a lot of moral authority, deservedly so. But often it is also our own perception of church that holds us back. Sometimes we desire for a church to be without grave sinners, as if that was ever possible. Or we are unsatisfied with the church community. Well, instead of happy Photoshop faces in the pews, all we get are seemingly repetitive rituals, old-fashioned songs, and boring people. Why do we need a church like that? Well, Jesus did not call individuals, but he called a group or a community of people. A community shares in the pain and the joy of the other members, as well as the quest for answers and help in times of need. Jesus lived for 30 years with his family, a time which formed and shaped him. It was important for God that Jesus experienced faith, family, and community. So how can we disregard it so easily? Including all the supposedly boring rituals of everyday life. Or if you want to use a literary example, most of you have read probably The Lord of the Rings. I used that example and a colleague of mine in philosophy is actually teaching a, the philosophy of the ring. Um, I use that all the time as an example. The real heroes of the story, um, the hobbits, are not born heroes. They are not strong. They are not um, empowered intellectually above all others. But they are living virtuous lives. They live good lives, very simple lives. And because they are living this life, suddenly, when a real adventure and a real crisis is thrown at them, they do the right thing. That's called virtue. 
often we feel uncomfortable in a community because of people we don't like or because they do not live up to the unrealistic expectations we have of them. Well, guess what? Jesus had the same experience. And we forget that all the time. We forget that his family, obviously not Mary and Joseph, but his wider family thought that he was nuts. He grew up with them and then claimed to be the son of God. He experienced rejection. And I don't think it's far-fetched to assume some harsh words from his relatives. We also don't know when Jesus' stepbrother James became a disciple, but he is not there at the beginning. So think about that for a second and think about the, the pain of being rejected by your own closest family relatives, perhaps something we can share. Leave everything and follow me. The church becomes the new family. We might not see the Photoshop faces of what Nietzsche desired to see, namely Christians should look more saved and happier. Instead, we see the downtrodden, the sick, the lonely, the incredibly and inexpressibly lonely, the vain, the jealous, the meek, but also the ambitious, all kinds of people, real people who desire saving. How much worse would they be off not going to church? Where would the meanest churchgoer be without that one hour that interrupts his daily injustices? Would he not even be more atrocious and more brutal? Church life is not pretty, but neither is the bloodstained face of the crucified Jesus. Christianity is a beautifully realistic religion. It goes to the very core of our existence with the power to change us but it's not comfortable. It's not a shiny veneer. And yet we must hope that even those of us who, th who think about this might one day be transformed. Connected with such unrealistic expectations about the church is the spiritual but not religious movement. I once said that's uh, about as much to say that uh, it's the spirit, uh, spiritual but not religious is about as uh, committing as a one-night stand. Whenever somebody tells me they identify as such, I ask them, well, not going to church must leave you a lot of time to pray for others. The response is usually telling. It's almost always the case that they do not, in fact, pray for others, but instead just focus on themselves. Such a stance is a welfare religion or wellness religion. You practice some spiritual exercises in order to feel better, but of course you consider yourself far too advanced and sophisticated to mingle with the boring crowd at church or don't believe in the hands-on realism of the sacraments because that's just magical hocus pocus. Keeping the focus on yourself is the pinnacle of Nice God theology. One looks for a feeling and not for the true God. So what can one do to combat such a worldview? We definitely should not dumb down the faith. And I think the Thomistic Institute is doing great efforts to fight that. And we should also not be afraid of showing how faith changes us. For example, when I bring my kids to school and they all attend, except now the high schooler, public school, I always make the sign of the cross on their foreheads. Not the teenage son, that would be, he would not like that. But my elementary school children. And I say in front of the other parents, God bless you. And in front of the other kids. And sometimes it's a little bit uncomfortable for the kids, but they appreciate it. There are plenty of ways of showing our faith. Praying at meals in a restaurant is another. Um, whenever we go back to Germany, as you know, I am from Germany, we always do this, and people are not used to that. I know in America it's no problem. In Germany, people almost drop their forks and knives when you do that in a restaurant. It's shocking to them, even priests. The church reminds us to sanctify our day, and we can do it with such 
little things. Or give you another example. Uh, I hate driving. I've never been, in, in that regard, I've never been, a, a, and never will be Americanized. Um, and I have to drive my son to Catholic high school in the morning at 6.40. And that's probably the, the one thing in the day I hate the most. And now I look forward to it because I use a rosary app. And so we pray the rosary. It's exactly one rosary to the, to the high school and back. Um, it works. And it's very good against road rage, I tell you that. <laughs> However, I think it's even more important to defend realism and a realist metaphysics. And realism means that we encounter the world and its riddles, and not what we believe, and that the world bends to our minds. Such a realism means contemplating things and persons. Instead of imposing our plans, onto them, projecting it onto them, abusing them, making them means to an end. Do I see in the tree outside merely the potential chair or the beauty of nature, of a living organism with manifold purposes, feeding and supporting life in so many forms? Am I even able to perceive the sunset and praise God for the gifts of the day? Can I see in the fog that makes my morning drive unpleasant, or the snow last night, something of the wonder about how water changes its forms constantly and surrounds us? Do I see in a person just what he or she can do for me, my welfare, my pleasure? Or do I see the mystery of personality, a spark of eternity in the other that want to be met? not used. It is realism that leads to a deeper interpersonal encounter with others, because I'm accepting the other person as a person and not as a means to fulfilling my needs and wishes. But such a realism hinges on the belief in truth. And for many, there is no such thing as reality and truth anymore because only feelings matter. Children are invited to feel and experience this or that, but are rarely given any content for their faith, even in many parishes. And there is really no, uh, no foundation to the, the fear of parents and teachers that kids can handle any content. They can. They can handle complicated stories. They invent, if you let children play, in the basement, they come up with games, and the parents among you will, uh, will acknowledge this, they come up with all kinds of elaborate game rules. They can understand that. I frequently hear students say, I feel that that is wrong, instead of giving a reason or an argument. And I usually respond, well, do you have a reason for why you feel this way too? Many seem to believe that feelings determine reality. Whatever we feel justifies our view of the world. But this is no longer realism, but a form of idealism. And of course, the Germans were very big with that in the 19th century. I make the world and its truth fit my feelings. My mind constructs the world. Truth is then not something I encounter, but something negotiable and up for definition. And this relativism is already taught to our children, and I'm sure it was taught to you by the time of middle school. And as a, as a parent who listens what the children are saying and by looking at their textbooks, um, one can observe that quite nicely. Objective truth is often, or perhaps even mostly, ridiculed and its possibility is dismissed. Instead, children are taught that their feelings are the most important thing. Thus, we should not be surprised that they give up the church the moment they can find better feelings elsewhere. God is the reason for this world, for all of reality, and he is present to us in every moment. There is an order to nature and morality that goes way beyond feelings. 
The moment we exile God to feelings is the moment we separate him from our real world. We separate faith and reason and ultimately abandon our faith. The beauty in which emotions, feelings, faith and reason can go together, you can see beautifully in the spiritual exercise of Saint Ignatius or in all the great mystics where all of them mutually enrich each other. To be clear, feelings do have their place in faith, but there has to be some substance to go along with them, because otherwise, otherwise faith is planted in midair. If feelings become our primary goal, we no longer seek God, but what we can get out of him. And this kind of search for God turns into a sentimentalist theology, a feel-good theology. But it wasn't the mumbo-jumbo, whatever of God, who became flesh, but the Word of God. Christ is the Logos. Our faith is and always has been rational, and we should not be afraid to scrutinize it. Most teenagers, and there are some interesting um, empirical studies on this, give up their belief because they were taught that there are no rational answers to religious questions and because there is no truth, since truth is whatever makes you feel good. And until we tackle that very foundational problem, we will not see any real change in um, the effectiveness of catechesis and of preaching the gospel. Kendra Dean's book, <clears throat> a really recommended reading, it's called Almost Christian, proves this point painfully. Her statistics show, and Christian Smith at Notre Dame would be another sociologist, that religious education classes and parental guidance have failed our youth. Three quarters of religious teenagers, three quarters of religious teenagers, today know very little about the content of their faith but instead have a benign whatever attitude to its religion. They don't see religion as being connected to the real world, but only through their own sense of self. They choose their beliefs and arrange them according to the needs, to their needs or liking. God is then just a body who helps out in times of emotional stress, but not somebody they spend time with when things are going well. God becomes a therapeutic means to wellness. That's why Christian Smith calls, about, calls this a little bit awkwardly moralistic therapeutic deism. The God of Israel, however, is not someone most of us would associate with modern ideas of wellness. Saint Joseph certainly wouldn't have. His life was uncomplicated before he was thrown into the adventure of salvation history. And you can, you can add any saint in the last 2,000 years um, as a footnote to the story. Perhaps we lack the desire to conquer challenges because we no longer hope and trust in God. When Jesus reminds and admonishes us in the Gospel of Matthew to become childlike, he not only expresses the timeless truth that children are born realists, but also that children have a genuine sense of hope. They still believe that things can get better, that God and his guardian angels will show up to help when needed. Children do not run after feelings. When they are happy, they are happy. And when they are sad, they are sad. They are realists. Their imagination is not ruled by misguided daydreams, but by the ability to see the countless possibilities of reality. People who have no imagination or fantasy have a very limited view of the world. They lack realism, and they're usually not very creative. What children, however, detest, and we see them down there, is boredom, because they love life and they love adventure. And they are great indicators of realism. Children encounter the world with a sense of trust and wonder. And G.K. Chesterton describes this beautiful in all of his writings. I would call him almost an apostle of 
childlike, becoming childlike, of childlike realism and amazement. One can feel his pain at having grown up and having lost the ability to experience things for the first time again, such as riding a horse or holding a snake. The child wonders why a, type, a table has usually four legs and not three, or what paper is made of, or how we get the toothpaste into the tube. <laughs> but a child can also use the things around her for new purposes, appropriating them for games. The bedspread becomes a sail or a fort, a piece of cardboard, a knightly shield. Nevertheless, playing does not do away with realism, but it trains it, and most importantly, reminds us that life is such an adventure. Such adventure is often what we forget in our faith life, and I don't exclude myself from that at all. Despite the fact that our whole life is an adventure in grace, as Raisa Meritan once said, and again, if you want another reading recommendation, Jacques and Raisa Maritan and Raisa, his wife, um, a convert from Judaism, both actually from, uh, from atheism, a, a remarkable couple, and some of the greatest writers of the 20th century. We can, however, step back from our settled experience and begin looking at the world and our life in awe again to rediscover the mystery of being and rekindle our faith. The great mystics teach us that one way of doing this is through becoming childlike, letting ourselves be guided by God and being invited into the adventure of grace. And the first step to that is listening and silence and succumbing to the word of God. Like a child, we can try to see for the first time again the strangeness of holiness. And holiness must be strange. That's the original meaning of kadosh in Hebrew. It's different from this world. Relearning what it means to encounter the unspeakable, the one who carries the meaning of my life, the one who hears me like no other. I could cite, I could cite countless saints and their differing views from Ignatius to St. Therese, it all, it all boils down to listening with the ear of the heart and seeing what we often overlook. Once we remind ourselves constantly of this mystery of being, we will also realize that there are countless invitations to become holy, to grow in faith, in hope and love, and to find even as St. Teresa says, between the pots and pans of the kitchen, God. To give you one story, probably not the best one, um, I was the sacristan in the seminary, and the hardest thing for me was getting up for our 5.30 Mass in the morning. It was the greatest sacrifice for me, and I really struggled, and I talked with my confessor about it. <clears throat> he said, well, you know, you, you should really... Um, you should really bring this into prayer and, and say good morning to the Lord. And I thought, you know, I take this very literal. And so, you know, I cleared, prepared everything for Mass, went up to the tabernacle and said, good morning, Jesus. I'm glad you are here too. Um, sometimes, you know, it, it, it takes those, those little moments trying to find an anchor in, in, the, in the real here and now. With God, nobody can complain that we cannot change the world because we can with us in it, we just have to start ourselves. Such a re-enchantment is not a flight from reason. Far from it. As I said before, making emotions the standard of right and wrong, which is called emotivism, denies objective truth. Such a re-enchantment, if that's even the right word, I'm not sure, as I understand it, rediscovers realism and wonder and puts emotions in their proper place. Fighting the emotivism is, in my view, one of the most important things we have to do because it has become the reigning ethical system in the Western world. And it keeps the, destroying the foundations of countless lives. 
Because there is no objective standard for good and evil, nothing is good in itself, and anything can be declared moral as long as it feels right. Just read through blogs, the newspapers, watch television, and you'll find them full with emotivists. They legitimize bad behavior with statements like, I felt it was the right thing to do. I hope you had good reasons as well. Because an emotivist rejects rational criteria as standards, such as objective values, natural law, etc., such a person is always right. Whatever topic such a person speaks about, he's always right. You can't argue with somebody who feels he is right and does not submit to rational standards. Emotivism is the worldview that makes social media so terrible at times. It's charged with emotions. Emotivism penetrates our society and injects a poison into all of our value systems. It eats away at everything. Feelings govern our attitudes towards our neighbors and towards God. And as a result, we cast away virtue and natural law because they don't feel right. The idea that we should subject thoughts and feelings to reason, church tradition, and holy scripture seems laughable at best to emotivists or dangerous at best. So we have become what Dorothy Sayers has called whimsical Christians, to borrow a phrase from her. Our concept of who God is was made to fit the mood we are in. And until we tackle that problem, we won't get out of the church crisis we are in. Sentimental theology is comforting like velvet and smooth like honey. However, whenever theology is not clothed in the tattered robes of the carpenter and drenched in his blood and a scandal to look at, a stumbling stone, that's what a scandal is. It's not from God, but man-made. Smooth Christianity, Ratzinger calls it interpretation Christianity. I think that's a little bit... Uh, it doesn't flow very well. Um, smooth Christianity is, of course, much nicer to look at. It has no edges or dark spots. It is advertised as the place where you feel welcome. It's a place without tension. And I say this, too, as a historian who has really struggled. I wrote a whole book on violence and the abuse in the Catholic Church in monasteries. And I thought for, for the longest time, should I even write this book? I had all the archival findings of centuries, and it bothered me that I didn't write that manuscript for years. And it was horrible to write it. Uh, I really felt what, I don't know if you read C.S. Lewis's autobiographical musings, what, what he says about writing the screw tape letters, that it was painful to, um, to go into these dark abysses in your soul. And the same if you, if you have to write a book like that. Um, but Christianity and its realism forces or invites you to do that. The Christian life is rooted in the encounter with Christ. Many believe that Christianity is primarily about following a bunch of rules, something like a moral philosophy with a religious coding. Yet, when we think of our faith in such a way and subsequently present it that way to others, we should not be surprised when people fail to realize that faith is like real life. It is always about meeting somebody else, as Martin Buber said, or as Joseph Ratzinger says in his introduction to Christianity, a walking towards the Logos. Ethics is just a means to that end, namely to help us become holy and Christ-like, not an end in itself. After the baptism of his baby brother in church, a little boy started sobbing on the way home in the back seat of the car. His father asked him three times, what's wrong? It's a happy day. And finally the little boy said, well, the, the priest said that he wanted us to be brought up in a Christian home, but I want to stay with you guys. <laughs> it's 
there is a beautiful realism in this answer. It acknowledges the lack and it confesses love. And yes, we all fail to live fully Christian lives, but Christ continually invites us to renew ourselves in the sacrament of confession and to see through that beautiful sacrament the world anew in grace and in wonder. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, so we have plenty of time for uh, questions for Dr. Lerner. Um, so uh, if you have a question, raise your hand, I'll be circulating with the microphone. I think that's an, that's an excellent question. And um, obviously emotions are incredibly important for who we are and for our um, um, mental health and for our, all, for our well-being. And they're God-given. They're gifts um, uh, that we have received as well. Um, I think it becomes dangerous when we become emotions, uh, when we make emotions the, the standards and the uh, for, for good and evil, um, when we are running after emotions, especially in the faith life. To give you uh, the example, and again, you know, somebody asked me once, um, who shaped you most in, in your theological thought? And it's a very hard answer. Uh, you know, I, I went back to my library and looked through all my books, and I realized I had a lot more C.S. Lewis books than anything else. Um, and C.S. Lewis has a beautiful line in his autobiography, uh, Surprised by joy, he describes growing up in a, in a household um, that was very pietistic. For the Nietzsche has the same experience. You have to feel God when you pray. And both have lost their faith that way. So that's the dangerous thing I see. Um, and I tell this to my, my own kids and my students. Um, there are times when you don't feel anything when you but it's the same thing when you talk with certain friends. You might just talk with them and you might not feel anything, but you still keep up that friendship. That's what perseverance is. That's what real fortitude is, hanging on on that rope when you're hanging on uh, uh, on a wall in, in the mountains and you don't let go. So I would say, you know, they are quite important. They should not um, they should be subjected to reason, they should be um, formed and informed by, uh, uh, by reason and external um, sources, but they should not be the standards of good and evil. Does that help? Does it answer your question? I, th I think so, being able to address them without claiming that they are like, the basis of truth. And, you know, when I say this to my students, when um, you know, for example, I, I, t I always tell them, I can only grade what you write and what you argue. I will be incredibly uh, invasive if I grade you on your feelings. So please avoid all feelings in your papers. You know, you can say that very gently and, and it, it makes them think. Okay. Um, other questions?
And I hope I didn't speak too fast. I tend to do that. So I apologize if that was the case. Okay, uh, thanks, Dr. Moore. This is a very interesting talk. Um, just the beginning, you were saying that uh, one of the problems with this uh, heavy motivist outlook and the view that God is nice in your terms is that it's incredibly boring and it leads people away from the church. And I'm wondering if you can elaborate on what it is about human nature that, that you think is left unaddressed by this view that God is that God is nice. Why does that not satiate sort of our, our, our appetites in the same way that the more traditional and classical outlook would? I think we are capable of truth. And uh, emotivism eclipses that entire dimension. Um, and because it does that, it, it really separates, um, I don't know what, what image one could, uh, it, it really separates the, the, the tree uh, from, from its own roots. Its desires to have the fruits of the tree without that that actually gives it life and, and, and sustains it. And, and therefore it, it is doomed to, um, to be a, a mere idealism and not to um, actually satisfy the soul, to put it very, very shortly. Um, we are called to be partakers of divine life, if you want to go into more theological terms, and not partakers in you know, divine, divine feelings or something like that. It's, it's more than that. It's, we, are, um, we are not minds in a tank, if you remember the, the Matrix. Um, we are real human beings. We are embodied souls. And that dimension seems to completely neglect that. Thank you. Other questions? Can you say it again? That was too fast for me. Okay, sorry. No, no, no. Um, I was just curious about your Always pairing. think it's my second language. So. <laughs> I was just curious about your pairing of the painting, Remembrance, Return of the Prophet Son, with the lecture, since it's such a well-known image that is certainly conscious of feelings of a nice God, like receiving the sign home. My reason for getting a picture was I didn't like the flowers underneath. <laughs> 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 so I said, we have to find a, a good picture of Uber. We were talking about it's a very honest, it's a, an, an elaborate choice. But um, we were talking about, um, I think you, you suggested Christ, um, the judge, the Sistine Chapel, and then the Don and the Holders is a beautiful Rembrandt image, which I love uh, especially because you have the two different hands. Um, by a lot of art historians pointing out the two sides of God, uh, the manly and the uh, female side of God, the punishing and also the loving side of God. So both go together. I think it's, it's quite important. And the, we have the chapter title, of course, The Prodigal Son. Um, but the chapter titles are not part of Holy Scripture. Um, so they are added later. Um, one could easily, with the same justification, call it the merciful father. I think it's actually a better way of looking at it because when we just look at the prodigal son, it's actually not the point of the story. The parable is about who God is and not who we are. So um, the, the parable, is, uh, as you know, of course, um, beautifully describes how somebody can find his way back to God through all kinds of um, uh, crises in, in one's face. And again, that's a, it's a realistic portrayal of what can happen, how far you have to get away from God to come back. And the mystery of forgiveness is 
one that I find truly alive, really only in Christianity. In that extent, um, we have forgiveness in other religions and forgiveness on a secular level, but that forgiveness reaches down to the depth of the human person, that even the most horrific things can be forgiven. Um, now it's 75 years after Auschwitz is liberated. Um, some, I've forgotten who it was, there was one or two um, of the Germans who were um, sentenced to death uh, at, at the Nuremberg trials converted before their hanging and received the Eucharist. Or my students always feel uncomfortable when I tell them about certain saints, they've, or uh, people that have turned their lives around that are not comfortable saints. So the murderer of Maria Goretti, for example. We all know Maria Goretti, she was raped, brutally killed, and her murderer goes to prison, converts in prison, comes out, lives in a monastery, and reconciles with his mother, with her mother. I mean, forgiveness means that the person who is most deeply affected, personally hurt, forgives. That's why a governor does not forgive a person on death row, but pardons that person. And I think it is a beautiful clue to understanding Christianity and the sacrifice of Christ. Christ becomes fully vulnerable. He becomes the object of hatred. And that's why God forgives us. He's not pardoning us, but he's truly forgiving us. And the clue, the hermeneutic key for that is actually in the, in the Our Father, as we forgive our trespasses. So forgiveness is, is a key to that understanding and, and being affected by the effects of sin. Does that make sense? Uh, doctor, if you don't mind, I'd like to follow up on that. So one thing your um, reflection brought to mind is Christ and all the times he's not perfectly nice. I think there are lots of instances of that in the, in the gospel where Christ almost shocks our contemporary imagination with how hard he can be sometimes. On, on the disciples and, and, and others. Um, but we also see Christ being, what I guess the word I would use is tender. Um, so I think uh, Christ with the uh, woman taken in adultery, or the, the woman, the Samaritan woman as well. Um, and I, I do think it's appropriate to describe him as tender there. And I, and I think about our being called to imitate Christ. Um, so I'm wondering, do you, do you think that we can safely infer from God's not being nice that we ought not to be nice? And if so, um, how do we distinguish the tenderness which we ought to display from this overly saccharine or overly submissive niceness that we ought not to? <clears throat> That's an excellent question. So. Um, it does not mean, and I don't think that we should all be, um, obviously not after this lecture, um, kind of um, angry, hostile, um, you know, um, uh, preachers, or however you want to say that. Um, but I also uh, did not say anything against the dimension of kindness and gentleness that, that you said, which is really, really crucial. The point that Niceness excludes truth, excludes profoundity, excludes depth. That is what I, what I want to say with, uh, with, with the fact we should not be nice. We are called to be saints. We are not called to be nice. And as saints, we sometimes have to say or do things that are uncomfortable and weird. And again, as a historian, I would have never wanted to go with St. Francis of Assisi on vacation. <laughs> you know, putting ashes on your food or uh, 
doing all kinds of ascetical things. I mean, it's not pleasant. You, you don't want to necessarily go on vacation with that guy. Um, two saints are not comfortable, um, but they wake you up. They uh, are showing you a deeper reality. Um, and St. Francis de Sales um, beautifully says once, we are convincing more people with a spoonful of honey than with a whole barrel of vinegar. So he's a, a wonderful teacher of gentleness and of, nevertheless, if you read his polemical homilies, also of standing up uh, for the truth of his church. I think one does not exclude the other. G.K. Chesterton is another one. So it's not so much the effective dimensions of niceness of the problem, rather the lack of the cognitive dimension. Is that Yes, I would say so. I would say so. And it, it becomes really a problem when we see the nice also as a dimension of uh, sentimentalist theology and projected to God. Yes. Other questions?